Hi, it's so nice to see all of your smiles. Today we are talking about chapter 8. <laughs> this is not working. Today we are talking about the work in chapter 8, which is transport in plants. Oh! So we know that plants need carbon dioxide, they need water and they need mineral ions and they get these from their environment. So plants actually make their own sucrose and amino acids by using carbon dioxide, water and mineral ions. Now let's take a look at xylem. It's such a weird word, xylem. It sounds like a xylophone. <laughs> xylem vessels are made out of hollowed cells that are joined end to end and their ends are removed. So think of it as a long hollow straw. Xylem vessels do not contain any cytoplasm nor do they contain a nucleus. This allows water to move freely up the plant. This is very important. Xylem, the movement of water is always upwards and it's always in the upwards direction inside a xylem vessel. Water can only travel up xylem vessels. So it's a one directional flow. The walls of xylem vessels are made up of cellulose and lignin. And wood, as we know it, the wood that you bry with, is actually made up of mostly lignified material. And next we're going to talk about flow. Flow vessels are made up of cells that are joined end to end. The cell walls of these cells are still intact. And these uh, are called sieve plates. They are, have tiny little pores or holes in them that allows the movement of sucrose through to the next sieve tube element. They contain cytoplasm but they do not contain a nucleus nor do they contain lignin. These are living cells and with these cells comes a companion cell. Now a companion cell is exactly what it sounds like. It's a companion. So it's right there next to the sieve tube element and the companion cell does contain a nucleus. It has cytoplasm and it also has other organelles. Now when I explained the xylem vessels, I said that water is only able to move up in the upwards direction in the xylem vessel. With phloem, the sugars produced can move either down or up. And this is because the plant produces sucrose in the leaves and a flower high up in the tree might need simple sugars to grow. So the sugars need to be transported through the flow of vessels up to the flower. Another example would be the roots need sugars to grow and the plant needs to move our sucrose from our leaves down to the roots. Now together xylem and phloem makes up a plant's vascular bundles. Um, these are the veins of a plant if you like. Now it's important to know that in uh, roots the vascular bundles sit in the center um, but when we take a look at shoots higher up in the plant the vascular bundles actually sit more towards the outer edge. I suggest that you create your own table comparing xylem to phloem. Write down all the similarities that you can find between xylem and phloem and write down all the differences. This is going to help you a lot in your study. Now we're going to take a look at water uptake. Water is taken up by the plant through the roots. It's pulled up as evaporation from the leaves takes place. Think of this process as almost you sucking on the straw so this would be our sucking action and this decreases the pressure which pulls more water up into our plant. Redraw figure 8.10 this can be a possible question in the future. Next we're going to take a look at transpiration but what is transpiration? Well the definition tells us that transpiration is the loss of water through evaporation of water at the surface of the mesophile cells which are cells inside our leaf um, and then the water gets evaporated from these mesophile cells into the air spaces inside the leaf and then the water will move out through the stomata. This is the process of transpiration. Now remember water always flows down a gradient. It flows from a high water potential to a low water potential. In the soil, 
we've got a high water potential, there's lots of water in the soil. In the area surrounding the plant, however, we've got a lower water potential. And water moves from this high water potential through the plant to a area of lower water potential, the air outside the plant. And the reason this happens is because water molecules have this cohesive property. And this simply means that the water molecules stick together. So as one molecule is being pulled up higher in the plant, the water molecule just below it will also be pulled up because it tries to stick to the water molecule above it. Now there are some adaptations in a plant that allows water to move up the plant. First, we'll start at the roots. The roots have root hairs, which allow for a large surface area for the water to uh, be absorbed. Next, the water goes to the xylem vessels. Now, these hollow tubes are perfectly suited for the movement of water up the plant. Inside the leaf, we've got another adaptation. There's an increased surface area as we have these air pockets surrounding our mesophile cells allowing for a greater area for water to be evaporated from the surface of the mesophile cells into this air space inside the leaf. This increases the uptake of water from the roots. Another adaptation is we've got our open stomata which allows water to move out of the leaf and thus decreasing the water potential inside the leaf and allowing more water to move up the plant into the leaf. Now scientists have always been fascinated with measuring the transpiration rate, but this proves to be a lot more technical than it sounds. It's very hard to actually measure the rate at which water is lost from the plant. However, we've discovered that the rate of transpiration is equal to the rate of uptake of a plant. So, scientists have decided that it's easier to measure the rate of uptake of water into a plant. And how they do is, it's very simple, you can simply put your plant in a glass beaker and then measure the volume of water that the plant uh, absorbs. Now there are some conditions that affect the rate of transpiration. Temperature affects the rate when it's warmer, transpiration happens faster. If it's cooler, transpiration will slow down. Humidity also affects transpiration, right? If humidity is high, there's a lot of air of water in the air surrounding the pond, which means that the air is already sort of saturated with water and it's a lot harder for water to diffuse, to evaporate out of the uh, leaf into the air surrounding it. Thus, transpiration will slow down in humid conditions and it will uh, increase in very dry conditions. Wind also affects transpiration. If the wind is blowing, the water that diffuses, that moves out of the stomata will be blown and pushed away, allowing for more water uh, to evaporate into the air and move out through the stomata. If there's little to no wind, transpiration rates slow. Light intensity affects transpiration rate. If there's a bright, light intensity which means lots of light then the transpiration rate slows down if there's less light intensity such as, uh, such as at night then there is a slower transpiration rate lastly water also surprise surprise affects transpiration rate if there's no water there's no water to be evaporated from the plant thus transpiration rates slow if there's plenty of water supply for the plant transpiration rates go up now we're going to take a look at the uptake of mineral ions into a plant. So, mineral ions are just minerals in their ionic form, which is the little positive or negative coefficient at the top of the symbols. So how it works is minerals get drawn along with water up the xylem vessels because these mineral ions get dissolved in the water. But the minerals are in higher concentration in the soil outside the roots than inside the roots. So how do these minerals get into the plant? Well, there's special carrier molecules uh, in the cell membranes of the roots. They transport the mineral ion against this concentration gradient into the root. And this is a process called active transport and it requires energy. Now we're going to take a look at the transport of manufactured food. So what does, what is this 
uh, food that the plant manufactures well. It's our carbohydrates, our simple sugars that the plant makes. And from these simple sugars, the plant can make amino acids, which can be joined together to make proteins. And from amino acids, other organic substances can also be synthesized. Now, sugars that are produced in the leaves, as I said earlier, might be needed by a flower somewhere else. So how does these sugars move to the flower? Well, they move in our... And this is a process known as translocation, which is the movement of sugars and amino acids from a source to a sink. But what is a source and what is a sink? Not this type of source, not this type of sink. A source is a part of the plant where the production happens. So if the leaf is producing the sugar, the leaf is the source. If the flower is the part of the plant to which the sugar is being taken to be used by the plant, this we call the sink. Now let me explain this with a little story. First, it's important to note that during harsh conditions such as when it's really cold or when it's extremely hot such as in the desert, during these periods plants become dormant which means that they sort of become inactive. They do not produce flowers, uh, everything in the plant, all the processes slow down. Now let's take a look at our uh, potato plant for example to illustrate the story. Our potato in the summer grows lovely green leaves, the plant, uh, the leaves produce sugars which get taken down to the leaf through the flown vessels into tubers which we call potatoes. In the tubers the sugars are converted to starch which is our storage molecule and slowly but slowly throughout the summer these potatoes grow and swell as they get filled and stored with starch. Now we get to winter, the leaves start to die down, the plant becomes dormant and our potato lies in the ground, so the stored starch safely inside. Now we get to spring and the plant wants to regrow its leaf as the temperatures start to rise. So what happens is in the potato the starch gets converted back to simple sugars which provides the nutrients and the energy for the plant to actually start regrowing its leaves. This is an example of how the leaves can be a source in summer which, is, which means that it produces the uh, sugars but and the potato is our sink because that's where it's, the sugars are taken to but in uh, not autumn, in spring the potato tuber actually becomes our source because it provides the simple sugars for the leaves to grow and the leaves become our sink. Question 34 by which process does water enter the atmosphere? Well, if you remember from the lesson, water leaves the leaf through the stomata, through the process of transpiration. Question 36. What are products of respiration in green plants? Now, with this question, it's critical to note that we're looking at respiration and not photosynthesis. Photosynthesis would produce oxygen. Respiration, on the other hand, is the opposite and it produces carbon dioxide. So our answer here will be water and carbon dioxide. Question 14. Which is a description of translocation? Now if you remember, the definition of translocation states that it's the movement of sugars and amino acids uh, in our phloem vessels from our source to our sink. So B would be our best option. Movement of amino acids and sucrose from source to sink. Question 24. The graph shows how the rate of photosynthesis of a plant changes with light intensity at three carbon dioxide concentrations. In each case, the temperature is 15 degrees. So the temperature stays constant. The different variables are carbon dioxide um, concentrations. Here we have the rate of photosynthesis and the light intensity. So with increased light intensity, there's an increased rate of photosynthesis. However, 
We are asked what is the limiting factor for the rate of photosynthesis at point X on the graph. So at point X, here we are dealing with a 0.4% carbon dioxide concentration. So we can see here as light intensity increases, the rate of photosynthesis increases. However, this only happens up to a certain point at which a maximum rate is reached and there's no further increase in the rate of photosynthesis. That is why we see this plateau um, in our graph. Now this um, limiting factor would be our carbon dioxide concentration because here we can see with a higher carbon dioxide concentration there is a higher rate of photosynthesis. So our answer would be A. So I hope you enjoyed today's lesson. Good luck with the studying and go and get those good marks.